Hey, it's your girl Lauren Elise, and I'm back with another episode of Wait, Run That Back? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Run that back? Run that back? Run that back? I'm Run ready. That back? I know you can't resist what you see. The curse that heals the hips. You scream, and baby, now you're mine. Love on me, hate on me, you can get me off your mind. So I want to apologize for the delay. For the past like month or two I've had family visiting and it was distracting and also they were staying in my home so it was just a lot going on so I apologize for the delay but also too after doing the last two movie reviews um, the energy was just so upbeat and so fun and a little bit controversial that trying to now do this movie which I've seen this movie long not even a long time ago but a couple months ago I've seen this movie and I love this movie which is why I put it on my list of movies to watch but now after doing such upbeat movies and then now to do this this was like so hard for me to do it was like the motivation was not the same so it was like pulling teeth for me to actually do this movie it's a great movie don't get me wrong it's a great movie but it's just not as a beat as the previous ones were and I kind of wanted to keep that energy going but it's okay it's okay we're here now and we are going to talk about this movie which is the imitation game if you don't know who I am or you've never seen any of my videos, hi, my name is Lauren Elise, and we are a community of people who love to watch amazing movies, but we don't have anyone to watch it with. So I became your best friend here on YouTube, and we do an in-depth movie review. These are the rules, though. Make sure you go and watch the movie first, and then come back and watch this video, because after this, it's a complete spoiler alert. Spoiler alert! Spoiler Spoil Spoil alert. alert. Ring the alarm. This is a spoiler alert. Wait, you still here? If you see me looking this way, it's because this is where my laptop is and this is where all the notes for this movie is. So if you see me glancing that way, that is what I am looking at. Just a little synopsis about the movie. England has their hands on one of the most complicated, top secret, unbreakable machines that the Germans are using to send out cryptic codes during World War II. This movie is based off of a true story and we do follow Alan Turing and his team as they race against time to crack this code so that that way they can prevent any future attacks and win the war against Germany. This movie is featuring Benedict Cumberbatch, which we all know as Doctor Strange. We have Kiera Knightley, and if you are into classic movies then you know her from Pride and Prejudice. Matthew Good, Alan Leach, Mark Strong, Charles Dance, whom I absolutely love from Game of Thrones, and the crown amazing in each and every role this movie will make you hate him but he is a great actor and i i just i love his acting anyways and matthew beard going through this strike is already a little controversial for me to be like promoting movies but i especially hate that i am supporting a harvey weinstein production hate that this movie did come out in 2014 and as I already told you it is based off of a true story so you already know how it goes with me whenever a movie is based off a true story I give you real life facts which I'm going to wait till the very end to give you some of those real facts all right now let's go ahead and get into this movie we're greeted by Benedict Cumberbatch whom is Alan Turing and he is the one narrating the beginning of this movie and you kind of get a sense of this very off-putting know-it-all kind of personality it was a little awkward it was a little awkward but kind of also drew you in because it's like hold up who is this jerk talking to me <laughs> like in this movie there's three different timelines that they just kind of like jump back and forth on so I'm um, I'm going to go in the sequential order of the movie, but I am going to point out what year each scene is in, so bear with me. So the first scene that we see 
it is actually 1951. So someone has robbed Alan Turing and police come to observe the crime scene. Alan is a mathematician professor at King's College and based on this movie, I don't know where a lot of these places are. I've never been to England, but I guess it's weird based on what they said in the movie um, that if he's a professor in King's, why is his apartment with his machines and all this all in Manchester? So I guess that's peculiar. Alan isn't the one who actually reported the robbery. One of his neighbors did. They heard some disruptive noises and they called. Supposedly, Alan says that there's nothing missing. Instead of the detectives and the police being like, oh, okay, cool, you know, let's skedaddle. We don't have nothing to do here. He's, it's just the way that he goes about doing it. It comes off very dismissive to the cops, which is alarming because it's like, well, what are you trying to hide? Why aren't you telling us what's missing or why do you not seem upset? Clearly, you're cleaning up mess around here. So that does imply that there was indeed a break in. And then the stuff you have is like these machines. It's cyanide all on the floor. It, it just all of it comes off as mm, there's a little bit more to the story. All of this piques the police slash detectives interest to investigate Alan. So now let's go backwards in time. It's 1939 and we're in London. Alan appears to be at a train station that I'm not even going to lie. It resembled Hogwarts. I was like, why are all these kids here? But if you weren't paying attention, there are people on the radio broadcast going out telling everybody we are evacuating the children because the British ambassador who was based in Berlin let Germany know like, hey, if we don't hear from you by 11 a.m., all bets are off. Let's get it popping. We're going to war. Did they hear anything? No, they didn't hear anything from Germany. So what does that mean? It's on and popping. Let's roll. Let's, let's, let's tussle. You want to fight on tussle? Uh, about, mm. and so now they're trying to evacuate 800,000 children from England. I mean, already insane. So that's why it looked like Hogwarts because it's like the train car... I mean, it's, it's kids of all ages up in this mug. Who knows? Maybe they were going to Hogwarts. I think Hogwarts was actually around during this time. I mean, they could have been going. Who knows? Because where are you supposed to send all these children? Where? Where? It's 1939. Who's catching flights like that? The, the planes back in those times, if there was a plane, ain't flying this many people out. So unless you put them on the Titanic, where are they going? Where are you sending all 800,000 children with no parents? I guess they took Whitney Houston a little seriously saying, I believe the children are our future. Because <laughs> they said, y'all got to go. Like, how are they supposed to get their own food? How are they supposed to get money? How are they supposed to do anything? And where are they going where it's safe? I mean, I don't know. You know, you we hear about all the major countries that supported World War II. But what about the little countries? Like, was Turkey involved in this? Was Spain involved in this? Greece? I mean, you'll never hear about these people. Are you sending them there? Where is it safe to play 800,000 children? Alan is actually traveling to, I hope I say this correctly, Bletchley? Bletchley? I, I swear the way it's written, it, it makes me think of bleh. <laughs> Don't disrespect, but it did. It, it, it's kind of spelled like that. I mean. Kind of spelled like that, right? Um, but I hope I'm saying it right. Bletchley, Bleckley, I don't know, Park. Um, and he meets with Charles Dance character, Commander Denniston. And 
we learned that Alan is a mathematician. He's 27 years old. I mean, he is incredibly young. He kind of goes through his accolades like, oh, you were able to do this at 23. You are able to do that. But it's just like, wow, you're 27 years old. He has this awkward back and forth with Commander Denniston. And it's like he doesn't know that Commander Denniston is being sarcastic or being a smart ass. And instead, especially since this is an interview, you just take it, you know, because it's like, well, I want the job and, you know, you're the boss. But no, not Alan. He just does not know to shut up and just take it because at the end of the day, this is an interview and this is the leader. This is the commander. This is the person in charge. This is the person you want to hire you um, because the way he's retorting to commander is giving more factual retorts instead of just being like okay and i mean i was a smart aleck himself so it's like two smart aleck people going back and forth and he almost didn't get the job but because he knew what they were secretly trying to solve which is enigma so in case you don't know what enigma is or you wasn't paying attention to the movie it's the greatest encryption device in history and the Germans use it for all major communications. If the Allies broke Enigma, it would prevent all the attacks and they could possibly win the war. Alan looks at these things like a puzzle or a game because Enigma is the most difficult problem slash puzzle in the world. So everyone else has deemed it impossible, but Alan is over here like, hmm, challenge, a challenge. <laughs> I mean, and he's cocky. I mean, probably rightfully so, but he's cocky without perception of how he sounds to others. And the reason why that is, is because they didn't say this in the movie, but I'm going to diagnose him myself. Alan has Asperger's syndrome. I hate that I learned Asperger's from South Park. <laughs> if you catch Rage of, you know what it is. But... <laughs> if you don't know what Asperger is, Asperger's is a developmental disorder affecting ability to effectively socialize and communicate. Young people have a difficult time relating to others socially and their behavior and thinking patterns can be rigid and repetitive. Asperger's syndrome is a condition on the autism spectrum with generally higher functioning. People with this condition can be socially awkward and have an all-absorbing interest in specific topics. Communication training and behavioral therapy can help people with the syndrome learn to socialize more successfully. I mean, and here's the thing. Most comedians have Asperger's because instead of responding to situations like how normal people may respond to them, that's when they just go to what they know. They know to be funny and crack jokes, and that's kind of like their go-to. There's plenty of celebrities that we know who have Asperger's. In fact, um, just to name a few, Alfred Hitchcock, Marilyn Monroe, allegedly, but I can kind of see that, um, Robin Williams, Chris Rock doesn't have Asperger's, but he has uh, NVLD, which is a nonverbal learning disorder, and is very similar to Asperger's. Um, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Dan Aykroyd, Jim Carrey. I mean, do you see where I'm going at? There's a lot of people who actually have that. In previous generations, we call it just being socially awkward. In today's generation, we'll say somebody doesn't know how to read the room, which is, goes back hand in hand into what Asperger's is. They don't, they're not able to read social cues. Alan cannot pick up on social cues. I'll even point it out in another scene where he verbatim says, we'll get to that point. But later on, he does say something in reference to it. Commander Denniston takes Alan into this room where they're observing the Enigma machine. But inside the room, there's also other people who are going to be potential candidates to be on this team. 
how the Enigma machine works, or basically how the German communication works, is the first intercepted message comes in at 6 a.m., which gives 18 hours every day to crack the code before it changes, and then they have to start all over. It has five rotors and 10 plug board cables. That's 159... I forgot the actual number. They say million million and I had never heard of that. Um, but I believe it's like quintillion. <laughs> so some crazy outrageous number. I mean it's 159 with 18 zeros behind it. Um, and these are all the different possibilities from every single day. So the machine doesn't decode its own message. Every German message, surprise attack, bombing run, U-boat assault all come through from this Enigma machine. And anybody can intercept it as long as you have AM radio. In the corner, you see a gentleman that's analyzing the group. This is Stuart Menzies, and he's part of MI6, which is a hidden division within the five divisions of the military intelligence. Actually, it's not even of the five. It's actually a six, but it's hidden. Um, so everyone only knows five. He chimes in when Alan says he doesn't want to work with the team. He prefers to work solo because he thinks like, oh, tch, these guys here, they're, they're going to slow me down. I got this. Unfortunately, there is 10 men checking one setting a minute for 24 hours every day. At that rate, it would take 20 million years for each of the settings. In order to stop an attack, they would have to check 20 million years worth of settings in 20 minutes. I mean, of course, that's like, that's impossible. Even with a plethora of men, it still would be impossible. That's 20 million years worth of settings. Who has the manpower to do all of this? The lunch scene. The group has started working together. Alan is off in his own little world doing his own little thing, trying to help crack the Enigma code. But honestly, he's not working as a team. They do try to start some sort of, of a relationship, since they are working together, by asking him, does he want to come to lunch? And Alan is like extremely literal, so he can't pick up on things like, these men are being friendly and they're asking me to lunch. In his mind, and it's not really in his mind, it's literally, like I say, it's very literal, so he's going literally based on what he said. Kane Cross says, we're going to lunch. Well, that's not really asking me, hey, would you like to go to lunch with me? You're telling me we're going to lunch, even though us normal people, yeah, we would totally know like that's them, you know, extending an invitation. But in Alan's mind, he thinks that they're just notifying him that they're going off to lunch. So then when they finally break it down, like we're trying to be nice and ask you to lunch, um, specifically ask you do you want to go get a sandwich with us he's like well I don't like sandwiches but if you are going to lunch can you bring me back some soup like no Alan this is this is not how it works I told you that Asperger's I told you this only comes off because obviously maybe during this time there's no real like diagnosis for being socially awkward so it just comes off like you're difficult to work with you come off like like you're better than us and you're using your intelligence to make us seem very small so who wants to work with someone like that nobody nonetheless though we do see alan working on this drawing but we don't know at this point what exactly is this drawing for now Let's get back to our current time. So our present time is 1951, even though it's still in the past for us, but <laughs> we're 1951 and we're now in Manchester. So the detective has done some digging into Alan and found out that he's a math professor. Now, maybe y'all can help me with this. No. The detective has done some digging on Alan, um, only to find out that he's a math professor. But upon further digging, he finds out that he has some classified military records. In order to 
read these classified records he goes down to that office for that department and he brings them a forged letter saying that he is authorized to see Alan's files. I don't know who that woman was in charge of record keeping but how did you not see that big old whiteout replaced with Alan's name typed over it? Like how did you not catch that? You you should be more thorough i mean obviously she doesn't care about her job but you should really be more thorough about who's coming here asking for said stuff i mean god forbid he was like an informant or something and anybody comes in and, and be ready to kill Allen, and all they needed to do was put some white out on the paper and say here you go like ma'am do your job let's now go back to 1939. hugh alexander which is played by matthew good he denies Allen the funding for this machine that he's trying to create so that's what he's drawing on all these papers is this machine according to Alan he needs a hundred thousand pounds which is equivalent to a hundred and twenty three thousand dollars in order to build this machine as he's trying to go to Deniston to be like hey fund my stuff he's like well hold up there has been a complaint turned in about you saying that you are not easy to work with and none of your group wants to work with you. In fact, they're refusing to work with you. So unless you have an answer for this, I don't have an answer for your funds. Alan tries his best to explain to Deniston what the machine is for. And the machine, as he describes, the way he describes it to Commander Deniston is you need a machine to break a machine. For us, coming from our generation, that's like a duh no-brainer but to them they don't have computers back then so it's like yes that was easy to break down but normally we don't have this access to this technology that you're talking about so it just sounds like a big hope and a dream and commander Deniston honestly after that horrible interview he doesn't even like Alan his own self so of course he says no and then Alan challenges his his authority and said well hold up who is your boss and since you won't approve me and I had to go to you as you know you being the leader who is your boss and his boss is Winston Churchill and if you want to go to Winston Churchill go ahead go above my head and see if he'll do it and I think he was really hoping that he wouldn't fund it but as you know since we watched the movie he does and not only does he approve Alan's funding but he also makes Alan in charge with the power of hiring and firing all of this makes Alan extremely unlikable with a target on his back wait run that back <laughs> I just wanted to see if it'll fit in. But anyways, um, so let's run it back to 1928. So Alan is in boarding school and because he's different, he's picked on severely. I mean, they're going to great lengths to pick on him. Like stuff that I'm like, wow, y'all are pushing it. I mean, it looks like it's an all boy boarding school, but still like y'all are really pushing it with the way that y'all are trying to torment him is like... This is really extreme. I actually always thought that when, um, if you've ever seen the movie Lean On Me, um, and they have like the tall loggers, that's not the only movie, that's just the only movie I can think of at the top of my head that does it, about how bullies will push you into the lockers and, you know, close it on you and lock you in there. I, I, my high school did not have the tall, long lock. For my high school, those long, tall lockers are like cut in half, right? So that was impossible to do. And this scene where they put Alan underneath the floorboards of what seemed kind of like almost like a stage, but for the um, teacher, that's where his desk was, um, put him underneath the floorboards and then, and then either screw or hammer him inside. That's so extreme. I mean... He could have been claustrophobic. That's basically being buried alive. Like, even when Alan went quiet, I was like, see, this is what I'm saying. You just, you just don't know. I know these are children, but whoa, this is, this is, this is brutal. But a boy came to save him, and that boy was Christopher. And he becomes 
Allen's only friend. Fast forward to 1939. Once Allen got into power, he fired two people like, you're a dummy, you're a dummy, y'all got to go. Now he has to fill those positions of the people that he fired. He puts out in a newspaper a crossword puzzle for people to try and break in under 10 minutes. So that's where we see all these people giving in a try across the country. Watching everybody live their regular day-to-day -day lives and because your country is at war you're having to just go down into these bomb shelters there's sandbags everywhere you just have to like duck and cover because people are just you know blasting you left and right it is actually crazy like being from america we don't we've never dealt with something like that 9-11 was about as close as it gets to um, us feeling actual attacks from anybody um so to see that that was like can you just imagine like okay our city's being bombed get down there or or seeing children having to put on gas masks just to ride the bus or just to go to school like that was insane. I think that's the blessing about America being isolated and then on top of our isolation, like the only people that we truly neighbor with is Canada and they're very peaceful. So we never had to deal with anything like that. But that's, I mean, even with all these war movies that we've watched together, like, just seeing these conditions and people having to thrive in them is something I can't imagine. So if you were able to beat that crossword puzzle, now you have to come to this candidacy um, testing. And so a woman arrives there and she is late, but the person who I guess is signing people in or whatever is not wanting her to come in because she is a woman. I mean, mind you, this is 1939. There's really no women's rights until after World War II, right? So, yeah, they're not really trying to let her in. So, But Alan is more distracted that they are distracting him from proceeding on with his testing. That he's like, look, I don't like that you're late, but if you don't sit down so we can move on with ourselves, it's, it's ridiculous. You should never underestimate a woman. But they did. But the crazy part is, uh, was she not the very first one who was finished with the test? Mm -hmm. finish a crossword puzzle that even Alan can't complete in six minutes in five minutes because period once the test is over only two people pass which is Joan Clark which is the woman and another dude they don't even barely talk about the other dude he's just in there I guess they're now invited into this high secret operation and if they reveal to anyone it's high treason and they could get executed for it um, so they have to lie to any and everybody about what it is that they do which for the most part seems like their lies that they work at some sort of radio station rewind back to 1928 our new fast friends young Alan and this boy named Christopher are sitting in the park and they're discussing this book that Christopher is reading and it's on uh, cryptography he describes it as messages that anyone can see but no one knows what they need unless they have a key fast forward it's now 1940 and Alan is starting his machine project but only one of the new recruits have arrived Joan is nowhere to be found so he's like where is she whatever and ends up at her parents house and you know he's like yo why didn't you come bring yourself on like we got things to do and she's like well I can't according to my parents because it's all men for the most part they wouldn't feel comfortable you know they want they want me to get married and stuff like you know I can't be working on all you men so on the spot which is kind of funny how Alan's mind is because sometimes he seems like he can't um, as my mother would say pivot um, when it comes to conversation and stuff but in this scenario I guess he really wanted her real bad real bad so he actually is able to come up with a lie on the spot 
saying like, well, if we put you with the female clerks and the secretaries and they have their own housing that's women based only, would you come? And she's like, well, maybe I will. Fast forward, 1951, the detective presents Allen's classified military file and you won't believe what's in there. It's a blank piece of paper. So he's like, hold up. Why is this paper blank? The last time we saw something very suspicious about this, it turned out to be a Soviet spy. So give me permission to, to really, to do a deep investigation on what is going on with this Alan Turner because he's just really smelling mighty suspicious. Because at this point, do we know if he really has any military experience? It could be false. It could have been destroyed. What? What is? What is the issue? If this is all how the detective is thinking. What is the issue? Skip hop forward to 1940. Um, Joan finally arrives at Bletchley. Another day has ended at midnight, um, and he is becoming increasingly frustrated. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, if they can help win this war and people are just dying by the thousands every single day then yeah I can understand why he's getting frustrated um and also too every day they gotta start from scratch so whatever was working the day before may not be usable for the next day and on top of that England is starving you know all those kids are not at home with their parents I mean things are just bad right and just and Hugh feels like we're wasting all this time creating a machine that we don't even know is going to work or not. When we could be sitting here and doing the manual work that they hired us to do. And, and also he doesn't want to take no direction from Alan. This dude is weird and he's just firing people on the spot like you're fired. And thinking he could pick people with crossword puzzles like that's insane. But he wasn't trusting the process. <laughs> Peter uses this opportunity to to chime in and and stand up for Hugh and he's like yeah well you know I also have a brother who's out there fighting this war so while you're sitting here trying to build this machine we're wasting time my brother is out there fighting for his life and yours and not even just his brother but he got friends too this part didn't really make sense to me because I didn't understand how Joan was really like considering I think Joan is under a paycheck for their department. I mean, I thought they were just using that lie of putting her with the clerks and putting her in the women's living quarters to appease her parents. But when it came to she did it to me seemed like she was ever actually inside the building with the guys which is what she was hired to do so I didn't really understand that but nonetheless is um, Joan is not specifically working with the men because of this Alan is sneakily taking these encryptions that haven't been decoded yet and taking it over to her apartment sneaking into her apartment when there's no men that's supposed to be there so they can go over stuff through the night and I'm just like if she's already working let's just say for the clerks all day and now you here you come in the middle of the night y'all can't solve this in 18 hours why do you think in my good sleeping hours I can then try to figure this out too I understand I'm smart and 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 completed this crossword puzzle in under six minutes but really this unbreakable machine that everybody and their mama are having problems with you think I could do it when I should be asleep yeah yeah so he thought it's in this moment that we find out that Alan named this machine Christopher and Joan kind of already knew about this machine that he was creating because there was a written theory that Alan created back in college and he's basically utilizing what he wrote in this paper 
and bringing it to life using Blackley Park to fund what he already has been thinking about doing. This And this actually makes sense and puts the connection on how, one, Alan even thought of coming there to help with the Enigma machine outside of the fact that he's just fascinated by anything complicated that involves some math work or whatever. But also, too, like, he really came so he could find someone else to fund something that he actually wanted to do because he didn't have the resources or the money to do it himself. Since they went to the same college and have similar interests, she read up on it. And it's basically an old school, reprogrammable, digital computer. Basically, that does everything. It thinks. It, it, what our computers now do, it, it can do that and then some. Let me rewind that. It can't do what our computers do now, but it essentially was the introduction to them a computer that they had never heard of or whatever. Which, at the end of this video, I actually have a lot of facts um, pertaining the, the truth behind this movie. So stay tuned for that because we're going to actually get into that. The following day, Alan comes into work and Commander Denniston is there with some, you know, with some security. And they're rummaging through all of Alan's documents and papers and whatnot. And he freaks out. One, I think, like I said, like I said, I think he has Asperger's. So if he does, that means he's on the spectrum of autism. And one thing you don't do with autistic people is that everything, it may not seem like it to you, but everything is systematic. Um, including where papers are placed, you know even like a little bit OCD in a way like so you don't mess with it so he freaked out like no what are you doing and they're like ah aha there's a spy amongst the group and honestly someone with no background no family ties difficult to work with a little bit secretive mm, who does that sound like mm, you Alan because whoever this spy is we have intercepted a, what they would call a Beal Cipher um, message that was headed up to Moscow. And this, this disturbs Alan because he's, I think for the most part, he's a very honest person. He may be weird, he may be quirky, to say lightly, um, but he is very truthful. And so, well, actually, <laughs> since we all watched the movie, is he really truthful? <laughs> um, it does hurt him that he's being accused of this or even thought to be a spy, a Soviet spy. Um, so therefore, Joan um, comes to cheer Alan up and takes him to go have a drink. Upon Joan giving her opinions and updates, she actually teaches Alan to be more likable and he's like you know you sure know how to be likable because you just went over and said hey to my group and they seem to like you and she's like well yeah um i'm a woman in a man's job and i don't have the luxury of being an ass alan because we don't right a lot of times we have to kiss people's ass because we're not, I'm speaking this as a minority, as a black woman. I have to sometimes kiss ass because there's certain things that my fellow co-workers, whether it be a male, whether it be a white man, a white woman, that they can do that I can't do. But at the same time, I want this job. So I have to sometimes bow my head and bite my tongue to get into position where I can then speak up for myself. But until then, no, I, I, I can't do that. I, I'm, I gotta be friendly. I gotta be overly friendly. Well, because you are allowed to sit here and be a jerk and an asshole 
um, and still get this position. And in fact, it not only get the position, but then was able to move up in the ladder and be in charge of everybody when no one likes you. And I don't have that privilege because as a woman, I shouldn't even be here at all. So that must have resonated with Helen because the next time he goes and see his co-workers, he brings an apple for everybody and he presents a joke, which he's not very good at telling jokes, but you know, it was still a funny, cute little joke. And, and you see him um, trying to put in that effort. Rewind back to 1928. Christopher and Alan are passing notes in class using his new knowledge of cryptography. We see in these notes though that Christopher says, you know, I'll see you in two weeks, my dear friend. Do 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 Back to 1941. Alan's team are warming up um, and starting to actually help Alan with Christopher and not Christopher his friend Christopher the machine Christopher is finally able to run but now it's a waiting game to figure out like how to make it faster with the decoding and it has yet to work and at some point a man reports to Commander Denniston that the machine is useless and it has not helped with any progress so Commander Denniston is like oh, good Good. Good. He comes in to not only fire Alan, but also to break this machine. Because at this point, who knows how long to expect this machine to work. They've never had a machine like this to know, like, oh, okay, give it six months and then it's going to work and we got this. We don't know. So at this point, this machine could be an absolute failure. So from Commander Denniston's point of view, we obviously we understand it. We're not trying to waste time. We're trying to win a war. This is, this is World War II. This is like one of the worst, if not the worst wars that we've ever had. We're getting bombed every day and you want to stay and play with this machine that we don't know is going to work. But on Alan's side, you haven't even given this a chance to work. I mean, like, it does, it, if someone creates a machine, it's not going to just work the very next day. I mean, unless we've done this before. But considering this is brand new, like, dang, you already trying to storm up in here and be like, what's good? Hold up. Hold up. I mean, actually, now I'm sitting here looking at my notes. I, The last time when Joan arrived, it's 1940. And now it's 1941. So, okay, it's been a year. It's been a year. So, well, maybe, maybe it's not that crazy that they was trying to storm in, but still, still, give it, give us some time. Heck, we just built it, right? Here's the beauty of having a team, because his team came in and Hugh stood up for Alan and said, look, give us another month, and if it doesn't work, we'll go back to our original way of trying to crack the enigma machine i can't even barely say it enigma enigma enig you know what i don't like the name of this machine <laughs> enigma machine we'll go back to our old ways of trying to crack the enigma machine but you know just give us a month to really give to give this a shot or you can fire all of us whatever wh whichever one you want to do thank god for that because command Denniston's like all right so i got one month figure it out oh i'm sorry i'm so sorry it wasn't one month he says i gave you six months to figure this out afterwards um they're all bonding at a bar together and alan tells hugh like look man i'm not no spy I know that y'all didn't really like me. I know we're just now starting to mesh together, but I'm not a spy, dude. And he was like, duh. <laughs> you, really? You, you couldn't even handle being a spy. But I figured out there was a bill cipher with a scripture of Matthew 7 and 7. And it's honestly too simple for someone like you to be doing. Back to the present time of 1951, they have something on Alan. Um, they followed Alan to a bar or a pub, whatever you want to call it, um, the night before where he met a bloke. Bloke. That's bloke. Bloke. 
I think it's bloke. That's the English way of saying like a man, a guy, a dude, or whatever. So, and it turns out that this dude was a poofter. That's what they they use the word poofter. In case you don't know what that means, because I barely even knew what it meant, it means a gay man. Uh, specifically, this man's name is Arnold, and you can pay to to get down with the get down, and that's what Alan did. He paid for it, and Arnold admitted to not only doing this with Alan, which, as we all know, is completely illegal, but also him and his friend is the one who robbed Alan. The detective is so disappointed by this because he's like, look. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's gay men everywhere, you know what I'm saying? So, okay, cool, we didn't hunt, we didn't do all this investigation just to find out he's a gay man. That's not what we did for. So give me an opportunity to do a little bit more digging because this can't be it. And give me like one more month to figure this out. We're back in 1941. Alan is stressed out to make Christopher go faster. I mean, now you got Commander Denniston going down his neck, rushing him with this process. Um, and as he's like trying to figure out, Joan comes and visits him and she lets him know, like, I gotta go. And he's like, the heck? What you gotta go for? Like, I don't need you adding to my list of problems right now. And she's like, I have to because I'm 25, I'm not married. And I'm living alone. Although, like, y'all not supposed to be living with no men. So who who are you supposed to be living alone? I mean, who are you supposed to be living with if not alone? Other than your parents. Okay. Anyways, so, yeah, she's 25. She's unmarried and she's living alone. And her parents wanted her to come home. Like, alright, we gave you a little freedom. But you're getting a little old. It's time for you to find you a man and produce some babies. And Alan, I really wasn't sure if Alan um, did this because of their friendship. Did he do it for Christopher? Uh, but nonetheless, Alan decides to propose to her. And the sad part within this proposal is Joan didn't even realize at first that he's proposing to her she's like who am I supposed to marry Hugh yeah I mean he's good looking or whatever but you know am I supposed to marry this guy no I don't want him oh snap I'm oh you're proposing <laughs> the disrespect okay Joan and I've seen real pictures of Alan and he ain't that bad looking now her on the other hand You have to understand yet, yet again about Asperger's, if that's what Alan has. I'm, I'm self-diagnosing, but I mean, it's not obviously said or in the movie. They just call him socially awkward. But in the case that he does, you know, they're very logical thinkers. They're not good at reading the room. They're not good at making assessments very quickly. They're taught things. That That's, that's where that comes in. They're... they're taught that once they're able to see something done they're able to mimic or they have to understand it from a logical standpoint so logically conveying his feelings is not his strong suit whatsoever and then he proposes with I don't know if that's a wire or a rope I mean obviously it was last minute and kind of just on the spot but still like yeah, this is not how I'm trying to get engaged for the first time in my life is with a piece of rope that you found in your pocket <laughs> or fish wire, whatever it is. At Joan and Alan's engagement party, there was a moment where she was actually describing this rope-like ring and it seemed like maybe, just maybe, she's in love with Alan too. Well, let me not say two, because we really don't know if Alan's in love or not. But, she seemed to be in love. Hugh asks Joan to dance, and Alan and, and Crane Cross, who's played by Alan Leach, they're watching them dance. Alan uses this time to confess to Kane Cross, like, you know, I'm not really into it. 
a woman like that or I don't know if I'll ever be into her in that way I think he means with the get down kind of way you know what I'm saying and he's like why is it because you're gay and he's like oh, gosh how'd you know I don't know how he knew actually because maybe y'all thought this and outside of those little scenes with his little friend Christopher, which we obviously knew hinted at something, did we really know he was gay? Because he didn't give gay at all. He gave awkward. He gave that he probably wouldn't get the most popular chick because he wouldn't even know how to approach her. He wouldn't know how what to do with her. You know what I'm saying? But gay? No, I didn't get gay. I didn't get gay at all. Consequently, to him being gay, he's really questioning, like, can I really pretend to be straight for this marriage like I don't know if I can do that and I can understand that because he's a very honest person even then he's not even quick on his feet when it comes to lying like it's only very rare occasions that he can do that but most of the time no he's too awkward to even do that so he's questioning it and Kane Cross does make a factual point and he's like Commander Denniston is looking for anything to put you away so you got to hide this on top of that it's illegal to be gay though i can say the only beauty in this moment is seeing that at least alan knows how to dance <laughs> look like he was two-stepping very nicely with his new fiance kind of like what i said earlier it now makes when we travel back into 1928 it makes sense why they're building this up because Alan is waiting for his friend to come back home from break and he writes him a private letter saying I love you let's flash back forward to 1951 so Alan is in the interrogation room with the detective the detective provokes Alan by asking does a machine or a computer think does it think like a human of course not but just because it doesn't think like a human being, that doesn't mean it's not smart. That doesn't mean it doesn't think. Also, we learned that the title of this movie came from the paper that Alan wrote explaining this theory. So the detective then says, what did you do during the war? This entire time of him describing what it was like from 1939 to like 1942 or maybe even 1945, who knows, um, has all been him telling the detective what he was doing during the war. So let's rewind now back to 1941. The six months is up and Christopher still is not working. So it's like it's searching for something, but it has no parameters to base that search off of. So since this is technically their last day, um, they go to a bar and was like, you know what? We can't do anything else. Let's get up. <laughs> Incidentally, Joan has a friend there, um, another like female clerk, and she's interested in Hugh and when he goes to flirt she describes that she's actually got a crush on this German that insight makes Alan wonder what what type of relationship does she have with a German at this point this is our enemy so how do you have a relationship with them so she explains she says each female clerk intercepts a message from a specific German radio tower and there is a counterpart who is tapping out the message on the other side so there's someone just like her on the opposite side who's sending out the messages that you know uh, that is being ordered everyone types differently but this specific German coder always starts his messages with C-I-L-L-Y which could be interpreted as his girlfriend's name like he loves her so much that he constantly uses uh, her name for his first initials of everything but the Germans are instructed to use random letters so this triggers Alan and he's like okay this is enough little bit of information for us to try to decipher all the other codes let's give this a try so he's running Move, bitch. he's not a, a Tom Cruise runner but he's running 
So he runs and he gets to the office and he puts in uh, these codes and, and well, it's not specifically this German's codes. It was what repeated words or predictable word can we use so that way it helps Christopher, the machine, to narrow it down. So that's the that's when they say the high Hitler. All of this, once he reprogrammed Christopher, it cracks the code. And they tested the theory on multiple messages just to make sure. And so they do that throughout the night that by the next morning, they're able to have a whole map of where they've previously have targeted, where all the U-boats are, um, what's coming up. With this discovery, they're able to pinpoint every boat previous and upcoming attacks. Joan looks at the board and she sees where they're going to attack next. And the next attack is going to hit like a bunch of civilians, like 500 to 1,000 civilians. Consequently, Alan thinks about it and they can't let Commander Denniston or anybody else know that they've broken Enigma because if they do, that means the Germans will know that they have broken or cracked Enigma. Unfortunately, Peter's brother is on this particular convoy. And as much as he begs and pleads, like, please, like, this is my brother, it won't, if we just save this boat and nobody else, that's fine, but let's just save my brother. And they're like, I'm sorry, because now at this point, I think the real reason why they didn't do that is because they only had, like, maybe 20 or 30 minutes to let the people know. So I think even then, if maybe if there was more time, maybe if it was maybe the day before, they could have warned the brother, but... This one, it was like, nah, we can't. So um, it leaves Peter feeling um, a certain way to Alan because he's like, who are you to play God? But I just felt like it was very misdirected. I mean, it was obviously misdirected, but my thing was he wasn't mad at anybody else but Alan. Everyone knew Alan was right. Well, I guess, you know, I just thought about that. Alan is the person in charge technically so maybe that's why he blamed Alan so hard. Joan and Alan meet with Menzies to tell them that you know they broke Enigma um, but they can't tell anybody not even Commander Denniston. Alan creates this method that allows them to attack um, in a way that it would be beneficial to the allies but small enough where it's not weird on how they figured it out. And what Menzies is supposed to do with MI6 is to put out these random theories or we interpreted this message or however, whatever lies they got to tell or whatever rumors that they got to create in order for people to not know how they got the message or how they were able to know or to attack whatever is coming up per Alan giving the instructions to attack this or not attack that or whatever the case is. So they actually codename this, this, they codename this Ultra. So it, it actually became the largest store of military intelligence in the history of the world. As they said in the movie, it was like having a tap on Himmler's intercom. I don't know who Himmler is. I actually meant to Google that, but obviously he must be somebody big because I'm like, who is Himmler? So within their new routines, Peter still has beef with Alan. And for this one particular day, he bumps into Alan, um, like just, you know, and knocks all, all of Alan's paperwork on the floor. Uh, while he is picking up this paperwork, he he's standing up and he sees a Bible. He opens the Bible and it, it has a bookmark in it and it goes to that Matthew 7 and 7, which was the Bill Cipher of a Soviet spy. And turns out this Bible is owned by Cane Cross. So Cane Cross realized, oh snap, you know I'm the Soviet spy. So he has a private conversation with Alan and he's like, look, you don't snitch on me, I won't snitch on you. 
because I know that you're gay and I know that it's illegal. So therefore, you snitch on me, I'm revealing about you too. One day, Alan either comes home or maybe he's visiting, I don't know, but either way, he goes to the apartment um, either of his or Jones and, or maybe they're living together since they're technically um, engaged, right? And so when he comes in, Menzies in, in there and he's reading all these papers and he's like, where is Joan? And he's like, oh, she's in military prison. And he's like, why? And he's like, because. These are the paperwork of some of the decoded messages from Enigma, which shouldn't be here in the personal home. It should be back on campus because they go through their backpacks and their um, bikes or whatever they came in with. They have stuff to check their identification coming and going. So how did these paperwork end up here? So you or her must be the Soviet spy. And he was like, whoa, whoa. Whoa, I'm not a Soviet spy. Actually, Ken Cross is. And he's like, oh snap, you should have actually been the spy then because really, I've been known that Ken Cross was the spy. I've been known way, way back when, before he even was brought to, I'm tired of saying this place's name because I feel like I'm butchering it. Bleckley, Bletchley, whatever. He knew before then and specifically placed them there so that way they can control the narrative that's being sent to the Soviet. Apparently Winston Churchill is too paranoid to tell information to the Soviet even if it helps win the war. So that's why Menzies uh, placed Cane Cross at this location so that they can control what's being leaked and control the narrative. And apparently Cane Cross is too stupid to realize what's going on or that they're switching out his his stuff. Now, because of this, Menzies like, you can't tell nobody and I need your help to send messages to the Soviet as well as, you know, what we've been doing with Ultra. So Alan goes immediately to Joan and he tells her, you know, you got to leave here because I don't trust Menzies. And instead of telling her the details, every time he would say something, she would ask a question. And when she would ask a question, then he reveals something else. I don't trust Menzies. You know what? Now our engagement off. Um, you know what? Now I'm sorry to tell you I'm gay. So everything he says, everything that she asks, he rebuttals with more information. But every time he reveals more information, she rebuttals with a solution. Like, you know what? I knew you were gay. I actually kind of hinted it. You ain't, you ain't been trying to touch on me. You ain't trying to do this with me. You ain't trying to do nothing with me. So... Yeah, I kind of already knew you was gay. <laughs> um, and so she re also refuses to leave. Like, we we got this. We'll be fine. I ain't even trying to be a good wife. And you ain't going to be a good husband. It's okay. It's cool. Because you know what? You're my friend. I love you. It's all woo woo woo. And so because she's, like, insistent and not refusing to leave, he tells her, he's like, well, you know what? All right. I don't love you. I don't care about you. I only use you for Christopher. And at this point, we now know that that's the first thing from the truth. I don't think he was in love with her. Maybe. Actually, he could have been in love. Who knows? I don't know. I'm going to tell you about this when we're finished with this movie. But nonetheless is, she slaps him in the face like, whoosh, <laughs> and decides I'm staying, this is the most important mission of my life, and you're not going to screw this up for me. I don't care what you feel, I don't care if you don't love me, I'm staying. Because period. And let me tell you, Miss Missy has a lethal mouth. I mean, do y'all remember when, um, when she was talking about leaving and stuff, and she was like, you know, you're a narcissist, and da-da-da-da-da. That girl got a lethal mouth, and so it's obvious that she would have said the most disrespectful stuff to him right now by saying you know everyone was right about you everybody you're the real monster mm -hmm. 
-hmm. The war drags on for two more years as they're also working on Ultra and they help the allies to win these victories until we won the war. But no one knew that it was them helping decide almost like they were God. After the war, Menzies basically sends them back to their respective universities, colleges, wherever they was probably teaching at or working at, whatever. But before they go, they have to destroy everything that they've done so far. They are the only ones that know that they broke Enigma. And it's not like since the war is over, oh yes, let's let's make a public announcement. We've been broke Enigma. Yeah, that was us. Yeah, they can't do that. Because at this point, we don't know when Enigma is going to be used again. So we need to keep this information to ourselves that we know how to decipher the codes. So let's burn everything. In fact, they don't say this really in the movie, but they also destroy the computer that Alan creates. So basically, they destroy Christopher, they destroy the paperwork, they destroyed everything. Now, they must return back to their regular lives and also act like they don't know each other. And never in the history of ever bring up Enigma again. Back to the present. Um, what is Alan? Is Alan a war hero? Is Alan a machine? Is Alan a person? Or is Alan just a criminal? I thought that was like probably one of the most interesting questions that he asked. Because yeah, what is he? I think he's all of them to be honest. He is a criminal technically um, because he was a Soviet informant by force. But nonetheless, he never snitched. So that, that makes him an informant. Um, he's a machine he's he's a person but he's also a war hero he's also a war hero too towards the end they reveal why Christopher never returned from break so now we're doing the flashback but this is like the last flashback to like tie up loose ends um and I don't know why in this moment young Alan denies his friendship with Christopher. I don't know if he was ashamed of it because it turned out that it was actually a romantic relationship in his mind or he had romantic feelings, but I don't know why he was so hard but denying him. I mean, he denied him worse than, than is it Peter, Paul, whomever it was, denied Jesus. I mean, it was, he was like, that's not my friend. We were only sending, you know, math notes in a math class because the math class was boring. I mean, it was just like, well, dang, okay. That ain't your friend. Well, we thought it was. So we were just being courteous by letting you know your friend has died from tuberculosis. Um, it turns out he had tuberculosis the entire time that he even knew Alan. So that was sad. Um, and that also kind of, that that backstory really tied in the emotional tie that Alan had to Christopher because I mean it was just it was something that just didn't even have a proper ending. This is where the movie if not already took the turn for the absolute worst. So now that Alan has described his time during the war to the detective it's 1952 and Alan is sentenced for indecency and Joan comes and visits him to see him deteriorating. He's shaky, he's twitching. Alan is going through hormonal therapy, which is a chemical castration to cure him of his homosexual disease. So they have him on this medication and it, you know, it messes with his mental, it messes with his physical, I mean, it messes with everything. Um, and it was either, he had a choice of either doing this or two years in prison. And Joan said she would have testified for him. Despite how they finished, she would have testified for him so that way he didn't have to go through this. But, I mean... I don't know how much her testimony would have helped and I think that's kind of what he said to her like oh what what you gonna tell what, what you gonna say okay we were engaged that doesn't mean that I wasn't doing this on the low 
you know? And she was like, well, you don't have to do this alone. And he was like, I'm not alone. I got Christopher, you know? I've never been alone this entire time. Since Enigma and since all of that, he's still been working on Christopher and uh, making him faster. But uh, he's forced to take this medication because if he doesn't, then they will take Christopher away. And as we just previously went through, we understand now what that emotional tie is to Christopher. As Joan and Alan continue to be around each other, um, he notices that she's married now. But it just everything is different. I mean, you know, he's probably looking at her like, dang, like she's went on with her life. Now here I am, I'm alone. And and I just, oh, was just so many times I wanted him to just, just tell her the truth. Tell her why you broke it off with her, you know. I mean, it's amazing that she even came to visit you at this point. But, you know, just tell her the truth. Everything about him is just different anyway. Like, he can't write anymore. He doesn't have his, you know, intellect and the speed anymore. I mean, truly, I hate to say it. Truly, he's Doctor Strange now. <laughs> Not funny. Okay. Okay. One thing that Joan tried to do is she tried to lift his spirits by telling him, like, you know what? Yeah, you know what? You're not a normal guy. You're not. But if you were normal, all the lives that you have saved, all these cities that are still around would not be possible if you were so abnormal. This part made me cry. After a year of his hormonal therapy, Alan Turing did commit suicide on June 7th, 1954, and he was 41 years old. At the end, they give all these facts. Um, so from between 1885 to 1967, 49,000 gay men were convicted of gross indecency under British law. Only in the year of 2013 did Queen Elizabeth grant Allen a royal pardon honoring his work which would eventually go on to create the modern computer. Historians estimated that breaking Enigma shortened the war by more than two years saving over 14 million lives. It remained a government secret for more than 50 years. And today Alan Turing's machines was studied for many years but today, we now call them computers. And that was the end of the imitation game. I do have some facts for you guys. So let me just go ahead and read them off to you. Number one, the real Alan was not bad looking. However, Ms. Joan Clark, Gara, Definitely made it seem like she was probably pretty, but yeah, but <laughs> yeah, <I> say less. <laughs> Number two, all of his machines were destroyed. I already said this to you, but yeah, all of his machines were destroyed after the war. Um, that's why he had the secret one at home. I also think that's why he didn't want to call the police. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's why. Um, number three, Alec kept up with Christopher's mother, um, the real Christopher, the one who passed away. Um, he kept up with his mother his entire life, which leads into number four. The machine was not called Christopher. It was inspired by him, and you understand the emotional tie, but, but, number five, the real name of Christopher was Bumba, kind of like the song... Y'all know the song. Anyways, that's the name of the actual machine. Um, number six. In real life, Alan told Joan a day after their engagement that he was gay. So he didn't just wait until that moment of Menzies. He told her immediately. <laughs> um, number seven. Joan knew Alan at Cambridge. She was already working at Blackley 
before Alan and she was not discovered by Alan. She was brought to him and the team uh, when her supervisor discovered her mathematician skills. Number, I said we're on seven, right? So number eight, <laughs> number eight, Alan's machine wasn't the original. It came from a Polish machine from years earlier and him and his team did a joint effort of building it. His modification to it was his creation. Number nine, Peter did not work with them until after Enigma was built. So the, and, and let's go ahead and go into number 10, he did not have a brother that died. <laughs> I, they say that this movie is based off of a true story, but it is more of a loosely based true story. The lies! There you the go. Lies. There. Number 11. Eleven. <laughs> Kane Cross was fabricated. Not completely, but the whole storyline of Kane Cross is not true. Um, actually, he worked at Blackley, but he did not work with Alan. In fact, they never even cross, cross paths with one another. And I don't know if he was a Soviet spy or not, but as far as any sort of relationship or him working on the Enigma thing, all false. He's a real person, just no ties to Alan. Number 12. <laughs> Joan never saw Alan again despite him trying to rekindle their relationship. So that whole her coming to visit him and he was deteriorating. No, he was sending her letters. He was reaching out to her like, please, I'm so sorry. I don't know if he like wanted her back as like his fiance, but as far as in like being cool, friends, whatever, she was like, uh, -uh. I ain't doing it. I ain't having it. And she never saw him again after after the war never saw him again lastly this is actually just something i've noticed not even like a fact or anything i learned <laughs> learning about benedict cumberbatch's roles this man always plays some form of a genius from dr strange to this movie um he there, there's some other movies and shows that he was in each time he played someone of intelligence whether it be with art whether it be with just the mind it, it's something it's all it's very much something very much something 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 very much something okay you guys we are finito this movie i procrastinated i mean i have family in town so that was a big distraction for me but I procrastinated with this movie. Like I told you earlier, this was a good movie. I saw this movie a while ago. This is actually one of the movies that helped inspire me to start this uh, YouTube channel. But I just did not want to do it no more. I just think the my energy levels was different for this movie. And um, I mean, it actually turned out not to be so bad now that I sat here and filmed and everything. But yeah. Yeah, I did not want to do this movie. Great movie. Just did not want to film it. But hey, I gave it to you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you were able to catch the graphic, the graphic for this movie is a... Computers. If you saw the computer sign at any time throughout this video, I want you to go find me on any of my social media platforms, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. I want you to let me know that you did watch this video by putting this emoji down in my comments and I'm going to check you guys. Also, let me know what you thought of this movie. The next movie is... Room. This movie, Room, is actually the 2015 with Brie Larson and um, I think it's Jacob Tremblay. I believe it's Jacob Tremblay. I could be wrong, but y'all see it right here. So that is the movie that we're going to be doing next. So you already know the rules. Make sure you do your homework by watching the movie and then come and find me for the next video. 
do not forget to like comment and subscribe and ring that bell yes ring the bell so that way you know when i'm uploading a new video for a movie that we have watched together so i can't wait to see you guys next time i will catch y'all later with another episode of wait run that back <laughs> bye